We are on the eve of Mobile. Senior Bowl week is just about upon us, and we are digging into this 2024 quarterback class. My name is Matt Hicks, the FF Educator, and I am joined by John Lobb, the Gridiron Scholar. John, to break down what I consider to be a pretty strong quarterback class in terms of the Senior Bowl, I'm I'm identifying right off the bat here, I think five of these guys have a legitimate chance to be drafted before day three of the NFL draft. And we're clearly in a situation in the NFL right now where they're looking for an infusion of quarterback <laughs> talent. And we've seen success doesn't always come from just the first round. So I'm really excited to dig into these guys. And I know you are as well. I completely concur, Matt. I think all, six of them are definitely going to be drafted. And there's a chance that all seven will be on an NFL roster if you include Taxi Squad. So I love this group. And I'll say we might not have the top guy like a Carson Wentz eight years ago, but we have a lot of depth and these are good players. And Matt, I was doing my research and I have a stat I want to share. This may never come around again. These seven quarterbacks have played 37 seasons of college wow. football. I don't okay. think there will wow. ever be that many seasons under the belt for college players. And it's a different group. We're going to see some guys have six years under the belt because of COVID, red shirt. But it's a very different group than we're used to, Matt. Yeah, that's a good stat, John. Uh, before <laughs> we get into our first quarterback, uh, we got lots of good stats over at the Rookie Big Board. You can head on over to uh, patreon.com slash rookie big board to get in on our in-depth rookie rankings, uh, player analysis, player profiles. And John, if nothing else, it's worth checking it out to get into that Rookie Big Board Discord. Get your personalized trade advice, roster advice, draft advice. There is no better time of the year to get ahead of your league mates. If you're watching, make sure to drop a comment. Let us know what you think. Uh, you know, who we're too high on, too low on. Any question for your rookie drafts, we're happy to answer it. And we appreciate everybody listening in as well. John, without further ado, let's get to Bo Nix. Uh, you mentioned it, man. Bo Nix is a name that we've known uh, for a long time. He came into college highly touted. And John, he's not the only five-star recruit that we're going to be talking about on today's show. No, there's a bunch of them. And I really think you have to kind of stop worrying about the narrative around Bo Nix. And a lot of that narrative stems from Auburn. He's 6'2", 217 pounds, Matt, fifth-year senior, who established an NCAA record with 61 career starts. So right away, we have a young man who has taken a lot of snaps, seen a lot of defensive formations, a lot of defenses, and thrown a lot of balls. Now, he took flight after transferring from Auburn to Oregon before the 2022 campaign. Watch film from both schools, everyone, if you really want to get a full grip of this young man. He was a five-star prospect in high school, and he set Alabama career records for total offense with more than 12,000 yards and 161 touchdowns. He had 127 yards passing and 34 yards rushing. And I still remember his first game for the Tigers. It was on it was on prime time. Ironically, the Tigers were playing the Ducks. And Bo Nix was kind of like the star of the game. He loved Cam Newton. He was a big Tigers fan. So ABC built up that narrative with Bo Nix. And as a true freshman that year, Matt, he was very good. He was SEC Freshman of the Year and SEC First Year Academic Honor Roll. In three seasons at Auburn, he passed for 7,251 yards and he rushed for 869 yards and he totaled 57 touchdowns. But in 2022, Matt, when he went to Oregon, he really soared like never before. He ranked 12th in the nation in total yards per game at 315. He had 44 total touchdowns, 
29 passing, 14 rushing, and one touchdown receiving. He was third team all Pac-12, Walter Camp Player of the Year, and Maxwell Award semifinalist. And last year, Matt, I thought he was even better. He set a program single season record with 71.9 completion percentage. He passed for over 4,500 yards. And my favorite stat in this group, a 45 to 3 touchdown interception ratio. Matt, that is being smart with the football. He was named Pac-12 Offensive Player of the Year, first team all Pac-12 and Heisman Trophy finalists. Career rushing, Matt, I don't think people realize this. He had 1,613 yards and 38 touchdowns. I think Bo Nix is going to go in the first round. I personally have a second round grade on him, but the demand at the position will push him up draft boards. Matt, what do you think when you graded Bo Nix? Yeah, I like Bo Nix. I'm I'm in on Bo Nix. You know, you see the arm talent. Maybe it doesn't blow you away right off the bat, but he's accurate, John. He's accurate through the midfield. He's accurate in the short field, and he can push the ball downfield. Now, does he have a Joe Midland arm? No, but most people don't, right? And he's got a good enough arm. We've seen this in today's NFL. You don't have to have a cannon to be effective in the NFL. What do you need to do, John? You need to have good decision-making. You need to have good processing ability. And Bo Nix displayed that. You talked about that touchdown-to-interception ratio. Now, there are some fantasy football players who get very caught up on age, right? How long did it take you to declare? Why did it take you so long to head off to the NFL? Uh, Are you going to have a shorter career? Folks, you know what? I, I do understand that to a degree. But at the quarterback position, I bury that. I don't think there's anything more valuable for the quarterback position than experience, right? Reps, live reps, that's important. And that's an advantage that Bo Nix has, along with some of the other guys we're going to talk about on today's episode. Uh, and quite frankly, John, you know, you can, if you get 10 good years out of a quarterback, that's perfectly fine for me. I do think NFL teams are are going to be sitting there at the back end of the first round. I agree with you. I think he's more of a top 50 talent as opposed to a first round talent. But we know in the NFL draft, there's only about 18 to 20 players every year that get a first round grade. So once you start getting into the 20s, teams are going to be looking at Bo Nix and they're going to be looking at somebody who they can uh, turn the keys uh, to their offense over to and he can manage the game. And that's not a negative term, folks. On top of that decision making and processing, he is athletic. He's mobile. He moves the ball and he is able to play, John, a little bit of hero ball for better or for worse. But NFL teams like that attitude. They like they're going to like the experience. And I think Bo Nix is the type of guy who goes down to mobile and just shines. So I think it's very reasonable right now to leave uh, Bo Nix out of your first round mock draft. But I think by the time we get to draft night, he's going to be uh, definitely in consideration at the back end of that first round. Somebody, John, who's probably going to go a little bit later, probably (laughs) a little bit later in the draft. But I got to say, I still think Sam Hartman out of Notre Dame has a shot to be a long-term NFL quarterback, right? Maybe he starts off his career as a clipboard holder, but we've seen these guys develop and elevate right into starting roles, even guys selected on day three. I completely agree. If he stays on a roster and he makes it either as a clipboard holder, which means he's a number three quarterback on game day, or he's on that practice squad and getting reps, Sam Hartman's going to get into NFL games down the road. He's 6'1", 212 pounds. In high school, he was a three-star prospect and the number 12-ranked pro-style passer in high school. He enrolled at Wake Forest in 2018, Matt. And I remember, as a true freshman, he started the first nine games of the year before getting hurt. And believe it or not, he was good that year, Matt, with 1,984 yards and 16 touchdowns. Now, he ended up with some injuries, so he redshirted in 2019, and he only started nine games in 2020, which was the COVID season. But in 2021 and 2022, he became a star for the Demon Deacons. He passed for 7,929 yards, Matt, and logged a 77 to 26 touchdown to interception ratio for Wake Forest. Very impressive. 
In 2021, he was the Manning Award finalist and second team all ACC. In 2022, he was the Manning Award finalist again and third team all ACC. Matt, I was excited when I heard he could have a sixth year of eligibility and he decided to go to Notre Dame. What was interesting, if you watched Notre Dame early in the season and Sam Hartman, he was great like the first month of the season. Unfortunately, not only himself, but the offense kind of tailed off as the season progressed. And I don't think the wide receiver core was as good as the Notre Dame fight and Irish expected. So when you look at his numbers, they're a little bit down. He passed for 2,689 yards and 24 touchdowns. He did finish his career with 978 rushing yards and 20 touchdowns, but I don't consider him a dual threat quarterback. I think he's proficient enough, but he's not going to go out there and get like 400 yards and seven touchdowns if he ever got the opportunity. What I like in my model, he averaged 8.2 yards per attempt. However, when you look at the quarterback passing efficiency, he's a little below my threshold. But I do like Sam Hartman. He's going to end up starting games in the NFL. How did you grade Hartman, Matt, when you looked at him? Yeah, I think there's certainly things to like about Hartman's game. You know, I think he's got a smooth, almost rhythmic throwing motion. I think he's got a clean mechanical platform uh, that he throws from. And I think those two things serve as a nice foundation for his game. Uh, When you look at Sam Hartman, you see a player who's not afraid to stay in the pocket under pressure. You know, he's willing to to hang in there, take a hit. And he certainly uh, did that a decent amount. Uh, I don't know that he expected to have so much pressure uh, after transferring to Notre Dame. That's usually a cleaner pocket to throw from, but they did struggle a little bit with that offense this year. And you mentioned it, you know, he's not a pure athlete, but he he can execute design runs. He's mobile enough. Yeah. He's mobile enough to move the pocket by himself sometime. There is a little bit of tale of two tapes, you know, when it comes to Sam Hartman this year. Notre Dame overall was much more successful in the first half of the season. And I think you can see better Sam Hartman tape at the start of the season. Um, and there was, you know, I think at the start of the season, there was there was the thought process that he could sneak into day two in the back end of day two because he was really elevating that offense. And I just think the season depth injuries, it caught up to the fighting Irish overall. Uh, and he did not have great wide receivers to work with. So I think, you know, given what we've we've been able to see from Sam Hartman, there's enough to think that he can hang around in the NFL. But I do, John, project him out to be a day three pick at this point in time. Uh, definitely somebody to keep your eye on, though, and definitely somebody who is going to, I expect, do well in the interviews, you know, uh, impress in Mobile. And it only takes one right. coaching staff. It only takes one coaching staff to make you a, a higher draft pick than folks expect, right? And John, I expect with this next guy, I think there's going to be a coaching staff. I really do. I think there's going to be a coaching staff that takes this guy much higher than anybody's expecting. He's my sleeper quarterback. He's the guy who I think is going to come out of Mobile shining the most. And that is Tulane quarterback Michael Pratt. The word on the street, John, is that Michael Pratt, who had a year of eligibility left, was getting some serious offers from uh, Power 5 programs to come in, do that last year, and help elevate the program, and I think for really good reason. But I think Pratt, you know, he's got confidence in his draft stock, and I think he should. I have confidence in his draft stock, and I believe he was the first player to get the invite from Jim Nagy and they, you know, they kind of show it on Twitter and they end up going to Tulane and they, it's really cool. They gave him a box and like, you're invited. So the buzz is there for Michael Pratt. Matt, he's 6'3", 220 pounds. He looks the part. And, and, I, and I'm not saying that other players don't look the part, but he does have the physical stature, the size, and the traits that you are looking for in a starting quarterback. He was a three-star recruit from Fairfield, Deerfield Beach High School. Now, he immediately impressed the coaching staff because as a true freshman, Matt, he made nine starts in 2020, which was COVID. And if you remember, I was really impressed because you're talking about a young man who didn't have a long training camp because of the shortened training camp during that summer. And he ended up taking over this offense, Matt. 
He had over 1,800 yards passing and 20 touchdowns in COVID on not a very good green wave team. But he finally was incredible two seasons ago, Matt. As a junior, he threw for a career best 3,009 yards and 27 touchdowns. He finished second on the team with 478 rushing yards and 10 touchdowns. My friends, that was the team with Tajay Spears. He was really good. It was Tajay Spears and Michael Pratt. He guided the Green Wave to the AAC Championship, and they defeated UCF. In that game, he had 394 yards and four touchdowns. I watched every snap in that game. I love the AAC. I was scouting Tajay Spears, watching Michael Pratt. And then they had the matchup with USC. Heisman Trophy winner, Caleb Williams, Lincoln Riley in the Cotton Bowl, Matt. And they beat him. Tajay Spears and Michael Pratt beat USC. You're going to hear the neg- the narrative, everyone. Michael Pratt's a winner. And coaching staffs and organizations like that. Last year, in 2023, AAC Offensive Player of the Year. He only played in 11 games. He had kind of a minor injury, missed two, threw for 2,406 yards, and produced a 22-5 to touchdown to interception ratio. He also added another 286 rushing yards and five touchdowns. For his career, Matt, 1,147 rushing yards and 28 touchdowns, He is what you are looking at in a modern-day NFL quarterback. What does your film study tell you about Michael Pratt in the NFL? I think the first thing that jumps out is the clean mechanics. He's got a clean release. He's got a smooth throwing motion. The footwork is there, and it's consistent, John, right? It's consistent, and that's really important. I think NFL coaches value that. He's accurate at all three levels of the field. That is something that I I look for in my quarterback prospects, especially guys playing in the group of five, right? You're always trying to take the player in the context of their offense, but he is accurate. You know, he's not just throwing into wide open spaces. He's making throws at all three levels and he's making throws in traffic and he's doing it well. He's a confident passer. uh, And I like his ability to lead his receivers. You know, it's, I feel like it could be easy, you know, playing into lane uh, and getting against some of these G5 defenders and just, you know, giving your guys time to run around and get open, but he leads his guys. He throws uh, with good timing. And you mentioned it, John, he's a legitimate rushing threat. He's explosive. I think he's got good burst. He executes design runs with good field vision. And John at the goal line, he's willing to get physical, right? He's willing to do a little bit of that Josh Allen. Yeah. Dak Prescott. He wants to, to run that ball into the end zone as well. You mentioned it. It's not quantifiable, but he's a gamer. He's a winner. He has elevated his teams. And, John, even when he hasn't won, you know, our first exposure to Michael Pratt, what was this, two years ago now? Remember the Oklahoma game? Uh, when oh, Tulane yeah, yeah, yeah. upset Oklahoma, that would have been 2021, maybe 2022. <laughs> um, and, and Tulane didn't end up winning that game, but they took a, a really good Oklahoma team to the wire. So it feels like Michael Pratt's always been punching up. And I I do think NFL teams are going to appreciate that. If you want that under-the-radar player to try to get ahead of your league mates, Michael Pratt right now is is the guy I think that you want to hit your wagon to. And and if you are, you got got two supporters here at the Rookie Big Board. That is for (laughs) sure. All right, John, before we move on to our next guy, as a reminder, if you want to see all of the guys that we're hitching our wagon to over at the Rookie Big Board, head on over to patreon.com slash rookie big board. Uh, the link will be in the episode description, whether you're watching or whether you're listening. Uh, like I said earlier, man, no better rookie Devi uh, dynasty ranks out there in-depth player profiles john for all of these guys i'm just reading off of my tape notes that are available for all the rookie big board patrons to read uh so now is the time head on over there and you could save 15 percent off with an annual membership if you get in on it uh and you better believe john in the rookie big board discord we are talking a lot over the past couple months in for the next few months about washington quarterback michael Penix, who just recently confirmed that he'll be heading down to mobile I'm so glad he got the invite. And the one thing, my friends, 
You cannot watch the game against Michigan and have a judgment on Michael Penix. This young man has done a ton. You need to watch film from Indiana. You need to watch the championship game against Oregon, the game against Texas, the regular season game against Oregon. To just make an opinion on Michael Penix in the championship game, you're not doing film study right. And you're not grading prospects correctly. He's 6'3", 216 pounds. He is a six-year signal caller. And he did guide Washington the CFP championship game. That's a big thing, folks. Washington isn't a school in which you normally associate with being in the championship game. In high school, he was ranked as a number 13 pro-style passer and number 54 prospect in Cal- in Florida. And I want to make this clear because there was a, a tweet going around with the film clip. Michael Penix is not a runner. He is not a runner. He's not a dual threat quarterback, everyone. He is a left hander who has, he's a long bomber. He looks like an Oakland Raider passer from the 1960s and 70s. He takes deep shots, everyone. Watch the film, please. He also played center field on the baseball team, and he ran track and field. So we are talking about a really good athlete. He went to Indiana, and he played for four seasons, 2018 to 2021. He red shirts as a freshman, and unfortunately, he suffered season-ending injuries in both 2019 and 2020. He tore a joint in his arm and his ACL. But in 2020, he was second team all Big Ten and two-time team captain for the Hoosiers. My friends, you want to see some good film? Watch Michael Penix from 2020. He was really impressive. This is the Indiana Hoosiers we're talking about in the Big Ten. And Michael Penix put some incredible film down and incredible quarterbacking before the injuries. 2021 was a down season, but he decides to make a career decision and he transfers to Washington with Kalen DeBoer. In 2022, he led the FBS in passing yards per game, 357, and he finished first in total offense. He set single season school records for total offense, total offense per game, and total offense per play. It was amazing. Associated Press Comeback Player of the Year. Third team All America, second team All Pac 12, and Manning Award finalist. Matt, I think he was even better in 2023. He was named the team captain, Maxwell Award winner, first team All American on the Walter Camp, Heisman Trophy finalist, and Davey O'Brien Award finalist. And some people think that maybe after the playoffs, they should have given him the Heisman. I don't, I'll still go with my man, Jaden Daniels. But I can see Michael Penix, he had a very good playoff. He broke the school record with 4,903 passing yards, which was the second most in Pac-12 history. And over the past two seasons, Matt, 9,544 yards and 67 aerial strikes. I do think he's the best long ball thrower in this class outside of the hash marks. What do you say when you watch Michael Penix, my friend? Yeah, I understand why folks are getting excited about Michael Penix. You know, you mentioned that deep ball. Not only does he have the ability to throw the ball into the deep field, John, it is a pretty ball, right? Like he keeps a tight spiral on it in the Woo! short field. He can fire a rope. And you mentioned it. He is not mobile, not mobile by any means, no, but not within the pocket, he is able to, uh, you know, move well. He's able to avoid pressure. He feels pressure well. Uh, and you can see, you know, that it's a pretty solid, um, it, it's a pretty, I, I like his lower half mechanics. They tend to be pretty solid. Oh, yeah. He's he, He's got this, you know, seven eighths release that, that, you know, it does bug me. <laughs> it, it always bugs me because I think, <laughs> You know, he's already a tall guy, and so I think it makes his release longer than it needs to be, and you don't want a slow release in the NFL. Uh, for in, You know, I, I have two thoughts on Michael Penix. I will say, I'm generally lower than consensus on Michael Penix. That, that's where I've been this whole time through. Uh, for me, 
Michael, if you look at the numbers, Michael Penix has great accuracy. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. When I was watching Michael Penix tape, I gained a greater appreciation for Roma Dunze, Jalen Polk, um, and oh, right. uh, Jalen McMillan. Because a They're lot good. of a lot of those stats are, you know, Rome coming back for a ball, uh, Polk winning a jump ball, uh, and that's not to you know that's not to take anything against um, you know Penix, but you know that type of accuracy it's not going to hold up at the NFL level. So I'm a little bit concerned with that. In Mobile will be important for Michael Penix, but the most important part of the draft process for Michael Penix it'll be Indianapolis. It'll be the combine. And it won't be any of the interviews, John, and it won't be any of the on-field drills. It's going to be the reason the combine exists in the first place, which is medicals, right? You alluded to it. Michael Penix has had two season-ending ACL injuries, and he's had two upper body injuries, one, as you mentioned, to his throwing shoulder. So that, combined with the fact that he will do his damage in the NFL within the pocket, it's just he's not checking a lot of fantasy football boxes for me. But that's we always give our honest opinion, John. I'm below consensus on Michael Penix. And when you think about the, the senior bowl, you think about those quarterback drills, those throwing drills, you don't need to be mobile to impress, right? You just got to have a no, big he's arm. Going, he's going to impress and, people at the senior bowl. Yeah. Yes. And so, you know, the senior bowl, I feel like, is, is a place where uh, Michael Penix's stock is going to go up. And I'm just going to encourage all of our viewers, all of our listeners to just – you know, proceed with some realistic expectations that that's probably going to ebb back down before we actually get to draft night. I think he's a day two pick, John. I think he's a he's a classic day two pick. That's the right level of risk that an NFL team is going to put into him. Could he sneak in, you know, pick 29, 30, 31 in the first round? Sure. You know, we can lay out that scenario, but the medicals are going to have to check out. And John, uh, perhaps the only quarterback uh, in the country that has a bigger arm than Michael Penix oh. is, is the next guy we're going to talk about. And that is Tennessee quarterback, Joe Millen, who I have had the uh, pleasure to get well acquainted with over the last couple of years as a volunteers fan, but I will let you go ahead and start us off. Other than the fact he's six, five and 235 pounds, which you're going to hear a lot about often, you're going to hear the narrative he has the strongest arm in the class. Because I do think there's a video of him sitting on his knees and throwing the ball 70 yards down the field. There's no question about the actual raw arm strength. Accuracy, pinpoint, decision-making. We have some challenges. But as far as actually just throwing that ball, there's no question Joe Milton's unbelievable. And that will attract people. You know, the old Jamarcus Russell when the Raiders took him number one. They never should have. But the same idea that Al Davis just saw the arm on the young man and was like, we're going to take him. A four-star recruit from Orlando, Florida. Milton enrolled at Michigan in 2018. So I've been watching this young man for a long time also. He redshirted his first year on campus, everyone. But he did start five games in 2020, and he played all six. Remember, it was a truncated season in the Big Ten because of COVID. In his first three seasons as a Wolverine, he only appeared in 14 games. And he only throws 152 passes with five touchdowns. And we mentioned it over last summer when we were doing our Debbie shows or our college fantasy football shows. My main concern is, Matt, he never had a starting job until this year, despite all of the raw talent. He transfers to Tennessee at the start of 2021. He starts the first two games for the Volunteers, but Matt, he gets benched for Hendon Hooker. So we're talking about a player that after four seasons on campus, he's already been benched by two programs. He did start the final 22 or the final two games in 2022 after Hooker is injured. Finally, Matt, in 2023, as a redshirt senior, sixth year on campus, he made and started 12 games for the Volunteers. He completed 229 of 354 passes, 65%. That's okay. 
for 2,813 yards and 20 touchdowns and five interceptions. What concerned me, Matt, and we talked a little bit about Jalen Wright video when we were doing senior bowl running backs. They tweaked the offense a lot. It it was interesting. I felt just, just watching the film, I felt they hid the quarterback. Josh Heupel did not want that type of offense. Joe Milton wasn't in the class with Hendon Hooker. So they hit the offense by running the football. Hooker was definitely the secondary playmaker in that offense, which to me is a scary sign. In his career, he played in 43 games with only 21 starts. He passed for over 5,300 yards and 37 touchdowns in his career. He did rush for 661 yards and 12 touchdowns. But Matt, there are more concerns and questions after I watch the film. What do you think about Joe Milton in the NFL? You know, John, Joe Milton is the classic quarterback that every coach is going to talk themselves into thinking they can be the <laughs> ones to put it all together. Because on paper, you have that prototypical size. And John, if you look at the yeah. mechanics, the mechanics are actually pretty good. He's got, yeah. And he's got a huge, he's got a huge arm. Um, and you know, it, it's, he can adjust velocity. So we're not talking about a guy that just has a cannon, like he can adjust velocity, uh, well, and on paper, John, or at least we've seen examples of him being pretty mobile and pretty athletic as well. So you have all of these pieces and I understand why, uh, Jim Harbaugh convinces himself that he can get this four-star recruit to be the guy <laughs> at Michigan. And then when it doesn't yeah. work out at Michigan, uh, Josh Heupel actually recruited uh, Joe Milton through the transfer portal post spring practice after seeing a full spring practice of Hendon Hooker, who he inherited. Hendon Hooker was yes. a Jeremy Pruitt transfer. Pruitt got canned. Uh, you know, Heupel came in, saw spring practice with Hooker, went, got Milton. And then, as you said, Milton started <laughs> off as the starting quarterback. In the year uh, that when Hendon Hooker, you know, after Hendon Hooker took off, that was history, right? That's that the, the start of the good Tennessee run. But, John, you correctly yeah. identified it. After the first couple, after the Florida game, you can see the change. Halfway through the Florida game, which is only week three, week four of the college football season this past year, you could tell yeah. Josh Heupel lost confidence in Joe Millen. The, the trajectory of the offense changed. Joe Millen was throwing a lot more short passes. He wasn't giving him the time to work through progressions because that decision-making, that mental processing, and the accuracy, John, was just way too inconsistent. And that doesn't fly in the Josh Heupel offense, right? That's not what the Josh Heupel offense is about. So you mentioned it. He still had a pretty good touchdown-to-interception ratio, but it was because he was not uh, empowered to throw the ball into tight spots. But all of that is to say... I think there's going to be an NFL team that talks himself into it. I don't know if it'll be day two. I think if it's day two, it'll be very late, like 75 or later. I think it's more likely to be early day three because I like some of these other guys we've talked about today better. But make no mistake, Joe Mitlin's going to get drafted. And at some point, John, we're probably going to see him throwing a ball in, in actual important NFL action. And I hope he puts it all together because if he puts it all together – Oh, we've got a potential all pro, right? I mean, easily. Yes. But but he's got to do it, John. He's got to put it all together. The next guy we're going to talk about, John, is somebody who I think has actually done a very good job of putting things together. You know, earlier on in Spencer Rattler's career, it was all about the highlights. But I think his final season in South Carolina, it, it was checking a lot of boxes. And John, from everything I'm hearing, the NFL scouts, the NFL community, they are much, much higher on Spencer Rattler than the fantasy football community is. And I think we're going to hear his name called a lot earlier than you're expecting. In a big week in Mobile, John, will probably uh, work to answer any of those character questions that may still be lingering out for the one-time Oklahoma quarterback star turned South Carolina Gamecock. I'm convinced that he's going to go in the third round of the draft now. I have At the my latest. question. At the latest. I, I have, yeah, I have my questions, but when I'm looking at the tea leaves, reading the reports, 
he's he, maybe he sneaks into the end of the second round. I think the NFL is going to like him more than I do, but I have to be open minded and I have to consider that a lot of NFL scouts are liking Spencer Rattler. He's six one and two hundred and seventeen pounds, and he played five seasons in college. Matt, another fun fact I just remembered. Six of these seven quarterbacks played for two different schools. This is the new NFL prospect profile, everyone. This is might be the norm moving forward, so get used to it. He was his five-star recruit from Arizona. He was the consensus number one quarterback in the class of 2019. He was an elite 11 quarterback competition MVP and was it was it the TV show The Elite Eleven? I think that's the name of the show. I, I, I he was on the television. It was a docu series. Yeah. Oh, that's it. And so we've been watching Spencer Rattler for a while. Everyone. He enrolls at Oklahoma under Coach Lincoln Riley, right? So all of our antennas went out. Wow, right? Elite Eleven MVP, number one high school record recruit. Lands with Lincoln Riley. I mean, he's been on the radar for a real long time. I went back and watched tape from 2020, Matt. So he only plays three games in 2019. So that's okay. We don't really, I don't look at that. He was just a freshman. I went back in 2020 and watched some of the Sooners action. I wanted to see what was going on. He had a good year, Matt. He threw for over 3,000 yards and 28 touchdowns. I mean, I forgot that he was that productive as a redshirt freshman. He was All-American freshman and first team all Big 12. Then something happened, Matt. 2021 is strange for Spencer Rattler, and I still don't always get my head wrapped around it, but I will say he's having a poor season, and then the game against the Texas Longhorns happens in the Red River rivalry. And Matt, the crowd was chanting for Caleb Williams in that game. It was a real surreal moment because before then, I just was almost like, it's weird that Rattler's having a bad season, but I can't imagine Lincoln Riley pulling the trigger, taking him out of the game. Caleb Williams gets into the game, Matt, and the rest is history. Everyone knows about Caleb Williams. That year, Rattler played in nine games. He threw for only 1,483 yards and 11 touchdowns. And if you saw his demeanor when he was pulled and how he acted the last rest of the season, it wasn't very good. But, Matt, he transfers to South Carolina. And for the past two seasons, I've seen a lot of (coughs) – excuse me, everyone. I've seen a lot of this young man. He passed for 6,212 yards. And he posted a 37 to 20 touchdown interception ratio in the SEC. So he actually transferred up, which I was impressed by. You know, he's going from Oklahoma to South Carolina. This is what I'm proud of him for. He was the team captain last year, Matt. And that goes, if you watch the Elite 11, sometimes his personality can grade on you. Let's just leave it at that, right? And it wasn't a lot of good stories at Oklahoma about his attitude. So the fact that the Gamecocks named him team captain, and he was the team MVP last year. I don't think he's a classic dual threat with a high ceiling. He only had 410 yards rushing with 16 touchdowns in his career. I think he's very good at scrambling. He's very good at buying time in the pocket. But I don't put him in that Lamar, Jalen Hurts, I don't think he's there. He might be Justin Herbert. Get you 450 yards, four or five touchdowns. What do you see, Matt, that the NFL says when you watch the tape? I got to tell you, I've I've come around on Spencer Rattler. I think he can be an impact player at the next level. First and foremost, Spencer Rattler has never seen a pass that he does not like. You know, for better or for worse, He's a gunslinger, and NFL teams like that. Most of these guys, they really do appreciate that gunslinger mentality. Uh, You mentioned it, John. There's been ebbs and flows, but he has never lost confidence in his game and in his arm. I think he adjusts velocity very well. 
I think he puts good touch on his ball. I think he shows the ability to hit guys in the midfield. And I always appreciate accuracy in the midfield. And, you know, John, he's not the biggest guy. Uh, you know, 6'1", 217, I believe is what he's listed at. We'll see. Uh, but <laughs> his mechanics are sound. He's got a clean throwing motion. He's got a crisp release. He's got really good footwork. In that, those, those mechanics, it helps him push the ball 45, 50 yards downfield, John, with ease. You know, sometimes these guys with the smaller frame to get the ball downfield, they need to air it out a little bit. They need to take more time in the pocket. No, he can do it, you know, right off of a, of a regular drop back. Uh, and you mentioned it, you know, his rushing stats aren't the highest, but he's elusive in the pocket. He oh, yeah, no, he's good rushing very well. And if you watch the most impressive part of his 2023 season for me was, he, John, he was playing behind a rough offensive line <laughs> in the SEC. Spencer <laughs> Rattler was under pressure almost every snap of every game. I'm not being hyperbolic. No. But his touchdown to interception ratio, John, it improved. His accuracy, it improved. The decision-making was always the problem for me at Oklahoma. I think it's the reason that he got benched for Caleb Williams. But in a, in a worse situation, he performed better. So I think he's somebody who's done well with experience. I was one of those people who I was always graded by his personality as well. From the interviews I've seen, I think he's come around. I think he's a lot more level-headed and grounded, but hasn't lost that, that cockiness. He hasn't lost that confidence. And that's something NFL teams do appreciate, John. So I think that he's got a real shot in the NFL. And you mentioned it. No, he's not Lamar Jackson. He's not uh, Jalen Hurts. But I think he could be Dak Prescott. I think he could be Justin Herbert. And that is enough to be a quarterback one for fantasy football. So, you know, if Spencer Rattler is a guy who ends up having, you know, late third round, early fourth round rookie draft ADP, I'm going to be in on him. Uh, and I'm going to get a pretty healthy level of exposure to him. And, John, let's finish this thing up with our last quarter back why don't you take it home here on uh, Carter Bradley out of uh, South Alabama hey last year we talked about Tyson Badgett the young man coming from division two and look at I believe he started four games for the Chicago Bears this year and he was in the senior bowl last year now I do think he was a better prospect than Carter Bradley but you know what we saw Tommy DeVito start games so if Carter Bradley's here Somewhere's in the end. Um, if you don't know, Matt's a Giants fan, so he's shaking his head on that one. Someone in the NFL has sparked some interest in Carter Bradley at South from South Alabama. He's 6'3, 216, so he does have the physical stature. He originally played at Toledo and he played four seasons for the Rockets. He only attempted 327 passes, completed 182 of them for over 5,900 yards and 14 touchdowns. Before the 2022 campaign, he transferred to South Alabama. Matt, he set all kinds of school records for the Jaguars, and I actually drafted him on like two best ball CFF teams last year because of these numbers. 3,326 yards passing, 276 completions, and 28 touchdowns. Unfortunately, last year, he did not produce the numbers that he did in 2022. But I don't think the Jaguars, watching him a few times, they weren't as good of a football team. He passed for 2,660 yards, and he had 19 touchdowns and seven interceptions. I'm looking forward to seeing this young man spin it in Mobile, and I want to see how he matches up with Bo Nix and Michael Penix and Joe Milton, how he looks physically and how the ball comes out of his hands. Matt, what do you think of Bradley? You know, John, I think you said all that, that needs to ah. be said about Carter Bradley. Let's uh, let's see. Let's see what we get there. You know, I think he's got a tough pairing. He's going to be paired up with uh, Michael Penix and uh, Bo Nix. So that should be interesting. If he, can, if he can hold his own, you know, in those drills next to those guys, that, that will be nice and that will help him improve his stock. But I'd say we're looking at, you know, uh, a, a late day three to preferred UDFA type projection there for, for Carter Bradley, at least at this point in time. Uh, John, this is the point in time. This is the point in time you're going to want to make sure that you are locked in to the rookie big board because the next time you see us, John, the next time you're watching us on YouTube or listening to us, 
We're going to be doing rookie profiles. It is that time of the year, the best time of the year. So make sure you're subscribed and make sure you're joining us over at patreon.com slash rookie big board, because this year you'll also get that bonus rookie profile. As always, we appreciate you checking out this episode of the rookie big board. All right, there we go. Um, 